to acknowledge that fact. So I'm wearing my glasses this morning and printed this thing in extra big font. So that's where we are this morning. Because I had to do lots of note taking. And as uh, I think Sue, Sue Duber asked me, she goes, are you enjoying this? And I'm like, oodles. <laughs> Except I also have to do a whole lot of homework because some of you are very crafty, I might add. Um, but let's read our text this morning. It comes from 1 Kings in the 18th chapter. Um, and most of you have read this so many times, so we're just going to breeze through it. So Ahab sent to all the Israelites and assembled the prophets at Mount Carmel. If you want to know where Mount Carmel schools or churches come from, welcome to Mount Carmel, everyone. Uh, clicky. There we go. Uh, Elijah then came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping with two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets number 450. It's a popularity contest. Look at that. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves. Cut it into pieces and lay it on the wood. But put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it onto the wood. But put no fire to it. Now he's given everyone all the choices. He gets the leftovers. Keep that in mind. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire is indeed God. All of the people answered, well spoken. This is how men decide to do things. We're going to have a contest, and we're, we're, who's going to win, right? And Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull, prepare it first, for you are many, then call on the name of your God, but put no fire onto it. So they took the bull that was given to them, they prepared it, call on the name of Baal from morning until noon, crying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no answer. They limped around the altar that they had made. At noon, Elijah mocked them, crying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he's meditating or he has wandered away. Perhaps he is on a journey. Perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And then they cried aloud as was their custom. They cut themselves with swords and lances until blood gushed all over them. They were covered in blood. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no answer, no response. And Elijah said to all the people, come closer to me. And all the people came closer to him. First, he prepared the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. With the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and then he made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. And by the way, this is like a measure. It's like a big sack of seed. So it's a pretty big trench. Next, he put the wood in order, cutting the bowl into pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, fill four jars, now mind you, jars are this big, with water and pour it on the burnt offering and the wood. Got to remember my clickers this way. So that the water ran all around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, the prophet of Elijah came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your bidding. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, so that these people know you, O Lord, our God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell, consumed the burnt offering, the wood, the stones, and the dust, even licking up the water that was in the trenches. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord indeed is God. The Lord indeed is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. Then they seized them. Elijah brought them down to this valley, and he essentially killed them. And that is our scripture for today, because someone asked me, what is your favorite scripture verse? 
and I said, you can ask me anything. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. And we say, thanks be to God. So it's like children. You can't pick your favorites. So next week will be another one of my favorites. Um, and so why is this one of my favorites? One, it's just hilarious because, of course, this is how you solve problems of who's the real God. And did it really happen? I don't know, but it is absolutely hilarious. And here's why it's hilarious. It's because it's not translated correctly, because this is one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. At noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, surely he is a god. Either he is meditating, or he has wandered away, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. There was a time period in our early centuries where it was thought that it would be rude to have certain words inside of the Bible. And so what they did is they made it PG, nice enough for everyone to read, make it kind of people get the point, but don't actually use the word. And they wanted to make it nice and soft and, and you know, whatever. The actual translation says, I'm sorry, is your God sitting on the toilet over a hole? Is he constipated? Is he unable to get away from the toilet to come out? Maybe he's having trouble going. Or perhaps he left on a vacation and he's having trouble while he's on vacation because when you go on vacation, you eat different water. They're the same people as we are. He is mocking the heck out of them. And it is so hilarious because it's what every teenager would do to other teenagers when they're failing. They will poke and poke and poke. And it's one of those things that I love about scripture. You dig a little deeper, you dig a little deeper, and you find out they aren't as holy as we are. They're just as awful as we are. And Elijah's a prophet, and he is poking as hard as, well, like, how much more insulting can you get? <laughs> Your God can't get over the hole, like get off the hole, get out of the outhouse. He really can't. Like he, he's stuck in the, maybe you guys need to get him out of the bathroom. Go help him. He's an old man. He can't get off the toilet to come out and help you. It's so good. That's why I enjoy scripture, because the more you dig, the more you find. The more you find, the more you laugh. At least I laugh, because I find more of myself in some of the ancients. They're not as good as we think they are. They're just as awful as we are, and we're just as good as they are. We're trying our best just as they are, and we'll kind of get into that with a couple of questions here today. So um, we'll have one of my other favorite scriptures next week, but that was uh, one of my things. Okay, there was Jesus. Where was Jesus? For three days between his death and his resurrection. Good question. GPS didn't exist back then, so we really don't know. Um, but by tradition, um, and we say this in our Nicene Creed, which we will discuss Nicaea in a bit, um, the Creed of the Church. We believe that Jesus descended into the place of the forgotten. Some people translate that hell or Hades, but it's essentially a place where people have not entered into heaven yet. They are apart from God. And in that place, Jesus went and opened up the gates of heaven, and all these people, whoo got a ticket. And that's the ticket to which we ride. And there's uh, songs about that getting into heaven, of getting a ticket, and things of that nature. Don't dive too big on the ticket side, but just understand that that is our tradition. Do I know what it looked like? Nope. Uh, cameras weren't exactly there at the time, but they created icons. And one of my favorite icons when I found out about it is in the back of church. It's on the left when you walk out, and it's called the Harrowing of Hell. And it is a beautiful icon of Jesus reaching down and pulling up Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve being the original sin, the idea of Jesus rescuing Adam and Eve. And in doing so, all the other saints behind them are also getting rescued. And the reason why I think it's the coolest thing in the world is uh, my church history professor analogized it in a, such a graphic and immediate way. He's like, imagine Rambo kicking in the doors of hell, and it's a one-man army that cannot be stopped. And it, it's not just three sequels. It goes on till the end of history. And you don't need any other help because it's Rambo. And Rambo's grabbing everybody out and putting this place to waste. And there is nothing there. And then Rambo leads everybody out. 
And then we find the end of the story, and Rambo's continually doing this thing. So every time I look at that icon, all I see is Rambo dressed with Schwarzenegger with his, well, Stallone, one of the two, with this big old thing. So the idea of Jesus kicking in the door, grabbing everybody out, and laying the entire place to non-existence is the harrowing. And then Jesus resurrecting and then coming back to hang out with the apostles. So that's that icon in the back. That's by tradition. If I'm wrong, well, Jesus will tell me one day. But that's what we know for now, and that's the, the harrowing of hell. Uh, what's the significance of the red flame on the Methodist cross? Good question. It's a single flame with dual tongues of fire. The flame is a reminder of Pentecost when the witnesses were uh, unified by the power of the Holy Spirit and saw as tongues of fire. And so one of those words when we say the United Methodist Church, that's kind of the idea behind the word united, is that the Spirit unites us despite our many differences. And I know that kind of is a bit ironic for what we went through over the 10 years, but that's the idea behind it, is the Spirit is supposed to unite us in the midst of the many differences that we have. Um, don't know if it works, but that's the idea behind it. So, eh, wait, is that clicking? There we go. If God is all powerful, why did he want humans to write the Bible and not just do it himself. There we go, because our brains would melt. That would be part of the problem, okay? So two things that differentiate the Bible between the Quran. Muslims believe the Quran was written by God and handed down to people, which is why the Quran is considered a, a, a different book in their view than the Bible. And there's a good reason why, honestly, God would never write in text is because all of you experience the same thing I do. You read into the text what you want. When somebody sends you a text message, it lacks a whole lot. During COVID, we wore masks, and it was difficult. It was one of the worst periods of communication because you couldn't see people's what? Facial expressions, right? And there are people, um, and this is where Schwarzenegger's name came up, he refuses to answer a phone without seeing somebody's face because he believes so strongly in the idea that people's facial expressions say more than the words, and he won't answer the phone unless it's on video. He's like, why, why would we not have use of this technology? And so humans wrote the text to try to figure out what God is trying to tell us, and what separates us from monkeys is that we pass down information. And so when God experienced something with people, people went, whoo, that's cool. And then when other people experienced God, they went, whoo, that's cool. And then when Jesus came around, guess what? A whole lot of people were writing, and they were like, whoo, that's cool. And so the idea behind Scripture is to tell us how God has interacted with us, which is why it's limited, because it doesn't contain all of what God's knowledge and infinite wisdom but it has all the things to point us to a relationship with God, which is more important than the text, because in that relationship, now we get back to the Holy Spirit, God reveals all of God's selves to us, and we go back to the text to continue to try to see, are we straying too far this way or this way or this way? The text helps us in that relationship. You have to have both. You can't do one without the other. People are like, oh, I have God, I don't need this book, which would be throwing out all of what God has revealed to all of people since the beginning of time. Um, so yeah, that's why our brains would melt. Um, okay, if sin is the result of free will, and there's no sin in heaven, so there is no free will in heaven. Whichever scholar decided to throw this one out, thank you. Ouch. You're laughing because you didn't have to answer this one. <laughs> Um, I'm going to lean on St. Thomas Aquinas, who said it is possible, notice I said the word possible, to live a perfect life. It is possible, because we know what the right decision is. The problem is our sin nature drags us to a place to make the wrong decision. It is possible to look at every single thing and go, this is where God would lead, this is how I don't sin, and yet we still do it because we are frail. And we are sucked in this world 
with sinful things all around us. And sometimes we sin by total accident. We didn't realize that putting lead in paint and then putting children's coloring books, telling them that they can lick the paint and eat it, true story, Dutch boy, thank you. So we didn't know. Now it's kind of a problem. Well, we've got lead all over the place, right? So especially in older Cincinnati houses. So because it's possible when you're in the presence of God, how could you not choose what is obvious? Because in that sense, is there free will in heaven? I would suppose so. There is a tradition of the falling of the angels, which I'm going to put way over here, and we're going to parking lot that question. But there is the option that we always will have free will. The difference is we have a much better ability to continually choose what is obvious. Hi, would you like to eat lead paint or would you like fruit? We're going to choose the fruit. Why? Because the answer is that obvious. So we will have free will to be able to do things and we will enjoy it. We will be singing with the angels and saints. Even those of you who don't think you can sing, apparently you will be able to sing wonderfully. Um, what happened to the 12 apostles after Jesus ascended? You who tried to trick me. Ha, ha, ha. There weren't 12. Thank you very much. So I already saw through your cracks. There were 11, not 12. Thank you. It is a trick question, but I will answer it anyway. Judas died. That's why there's only 11. Matthias was the one who was elected after, uh, because they felt they needed to keep 12, the 12 tribes, the 12 stones, which we just read in our scripture. All right. So how do we know? <sighs> We're doing the best we can. Eusebius wrote uh, church history. It's sitting on my shelf if you would like to pull it out. It's quite fascinating. So this is where they all kind of went. Partha went to Thomas, uh, which ended up in India, which is why almost every Indian church is named St. Thomas, some such thing. Uh, Scalithia to Andrew, good luck pronouncing that. It doesn't exist anymore, which is basically Asia Minor. Uh, John, who stayed with Mary, went to Patmos. He died in Ephesus. Um, Peter appears to have preached in Pontus, Galatia, by Mythia, which is kind of in that same general area, Cappadocia and Asia to the Jews of uh, the dispersion, and at last swung back to Rome. He was crucified, head downwards. He'd requested that he would suffer in this way so he wouldn't die like Jesus. Andrew, Peter's brother, was crucified. He didn't get a whole long life after the resurrection, so we don't know much about him other than too bad, so sad. Sorry about that, boss. Uh, Paul, we know who Paul is, uh, preached the gospel of Christ, Jerusalem, to all these things. He suffered martyrdom in Rome under Nero, and we have a question mark there because it's kind of like, was it under Nero or wasn't? It's not like people kept 100% records, but sometime around that area. Um, so most of that came from Origen in the third volume uh, on his commentary in Genesis, and I don't know why they started putting historical things when they're commentating on Genesis, but... That's where it is, and if you want to know who Origen is, he was one of the early church fathers, similar to Augustine or St. Thomas Aquinas. He just lived 150, 200. Very early guy. He's one of my favorite dudes. Uh, James the Greater, son of Zebedee, executed by Herod. Philip uh, went to Asia Minor. Matthew went all over the place, Ethiopia, Persia, Parthia. Um, we don't really know what happened to Matthew. Some reports say he was martyred. Some say he died a nice, quiet death. He never made it back to central civilization. Bartholomew went to India, Armenia, Ethiopia, Mesopotamia. He got around. Um, we don't know if he was beheaded or flailed, but he, he was a martyr for the faith. Uh, James the Lesser, which is different than James the Greater. He was a leader in the Jerusalem church. He stayed a lot closer to home. Uh, Simon the Zealot, this is not Peter, this is a different Simon. He went to Egypt, North Africa, Persia, um, where he's believed to be martyred, mainly because he just honestly didn't go back home. Um, there we go. So that's what happened to our lovely friends after the resurrection. Thank you for the trick question. One, two, three. Okay, so we're going to set a time limit here, which I appreciate. Because if you want to get me to stop talking, say something like, I need this in three bullet points, and or you have five minutes. Which mostly works, Tom. <laughs> mostly works. 
So I'm going to attempt to honor this wonderful request because there are books. How big are the books have you been reading? This big, this big, like Angie's been reading books on the Trinity and they're all like, yay, something big. So it, Angie's my proctor here to determine whether or not I've fallen over on this particular thing. I will say this is, this is a lifetime's worth of work that you're asking me to do in five minutes, but I will do my best and go. All right, so there are three persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, yet there is only one God. We're all good on that part? All right, it goes downhill from here. All right, oh, come here, come here, come here. There we go. All right, so one of the analogies you will hear is like water. You can find water in three different forms, liquid, ice, and vapor. This is wrong. This is modalism. Modalism is an ancient heresy confessed by teachers such as Noelius and Sibelius, which espouses that God is not three distinct persons, but that he merely reveals himself in three different forms. This heresy was clearly condemned in Canon 1 of the First Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and those who confess it cannot rightly be considered part of the Church Catholic. So if you're considering the Trinity in three different modes, you're wrong. The Trinity is like, you might have heard this one, the sun and the sky, where you have the star, the light, and the heat. This is also wrong. This is called Arianism, right? And so a theology which states that Christ and the Holy Spirit are creations of the Father and not one in nature with him, exactly how heat and light are not the star itself, but are merely creations of the star. So this is Arianism. The Trinity is like a three-leaf clover. Some of you have heard this one before. This is partialism, a heresy of which asserts that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are not distinct persons of the Godhead, but are different parts of God, each composing one-third of the divine. And who confesses the heresy of partialism? That would be the first season of the cartoon program Voltron, where five robot lion cats merge together in one form, Savarai robot. Anybody know this cartoon? Yes? Yeah, it's really... It's partialism. It's also incorrect. The Trinity, this is another example, is, some, uh, is how a man can be a husband, a father, and an employer. And this is modalism again. It's a mode of being, so we're back to modalism again. Oh, three layers of an apple. Someone has that lovely expression, and that one is partialism revisited. So this is where we're going to land. The Trinity is a mystery with, which cannot be comprehended by human reason, but it is understood only through faith and is best confessed in the words of the Athanasian Creed, which states, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confusing the persons nor dividing the substance that we are compelled by the Christian truth to confess that each distinct person of God and Lord and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one equal in glory, co-equal in majesty. That is the definition of the Trinity. And yes, Santa punched Arius. And I did that in under three minutes and 45 seconds. So what is the story about Santa and Arius? Uh, in the Council of Nicaea, roughly 325, because the council lasted like 20 years. So sometime between 300 and 325, there's this bishop named St. Nicholas. And St. Nicholas loves the Trinity. And they're having a debate about what is the Trinity and what should the church believe. And that is where we get the Nicene Creed. That's where it comes from. It comes from this council. And they stuck around for like 20 years. There's a meeting that could have been a Zoom call. So in the middle of this, they allow people to speak. And so Arius is turned to get up and make his case. And so Arius, Arianism, God then created Jesus, which created the Holy Spirit. And why is this a problem? Because you might hear the term Arianism, that God has created us to be demigods. We've had people try to do that in forms of government and other social meetings and such, such things. So 
it's the idea that God had created Jesus above us, right? Um, but Jesus wasn't fully God. Um, and then the other side of that is people use Arianism to say that there are certain groups of humans that are better than other humans. That is the definition of Arianism, right? So this comes from Arius. Arius was a real person who got up there and made the argument that there is a God and God created Jesus and Jesus is better than us because he could do the magical things. And so Arius wouldn't shut up because there's no clock. You can just pontificate. You ever heard the term pontification? You don't interrupt the Pope. They didn't have, well, they kind of had a, anyway. He was pontificating and he wouldn't stop. And it was well past lunchtime as tradition holds. And so St. Nicholas got up and cold cocked him straight to the floor. And there was a brawl and he was banned for two weeks but it's 100% true. It absolutely happened, and so every Christmas time between all the nerd theologians, we all go, ho, 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 Arius, and have this little joke about St. Nicholas. Um, but yes, there was a spirited debate about the Trinity, and so after the uh, end of the Council of Nicaea, Arius was uh, condemned and considered a heretic, and he was booted out of the church, and Arius formed his own little group, and of course it fizzled out after about 50 years because nobody follows a guy who gets punched out by Santa Claus. So uh, that's the Trinity. It really is a mystery. St. Thomas Aquinas talked about in a book this thick, look around in nature and you will find the Trinity and all the ways that things are continually giving to one another in this beautiful cycle. And so I go back to this very long, where is it? There it is. There is the Athanasian Creed, uh, that we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, never confusing the persons nor dividing the substance to confess that each distinct person is God and Lord and that the deity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is equal in glory and co-equal in majesty. And the very fancy word is homoousios, which for those of you scoring at home is different than homoousios, which means distinctly different. And the difference between those is literally an I. Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you.